Well, good morning, everyone. Coming to you today from our remote mobile studio, my vehicle, because <laughs> I had uh, an errand to run and had to uh, be somewhere else. So I am on the road today. Welcome to Call to Action. And I hope everyone had a blessed and wonderful family filled Easter holiday. We have a lot going on in the legislature. It's getting closer and closer to June. And as the sun gets warmer on our faces, the heat, it heats up in Legislative Hall as well. Today we have joining us Representative Steve Smick. Now, Steve and I have known each other for several decades, yeah. multiple, multiple decades. <laughs> and uh, he's uh, been a great member of the Republican Party and a great representative for his district in Sussex County. So welcome this morning, Steve. Good morning, Jane, and thank you, George. So, how uh, tell us um, a little bit about your background, where you, where you, uh, what you have done in your life and your occupation, that kind of thing. Sure. The um, I was born in Delaware, actually in Wilmington. My father was a trooper before me. Um, he was transferred to Sussex County. So, about the fifth grade was my very first day of school down in uh, Sussex, um, and I grew up in the area of Oak Orchard. Um, the beauty of doing that is the, the community was so strong. Um, I wanted to give back and giving back, I started with the military, um, went into the National Guard where I've got uh, actually one of your listeners, Dallas Wingate. Uh, that's when I first uh, met him was in the Delaware National Guard. The, we ended up having um, uh, noticing that in the National Guard, you're very busy, but they weren't used as much back then. Um, and they started to get greater use after 9-11. Um, what I found is that I, I could serve the community even better as a police officer. So I became a Delaware State Trooper, uh, recognizing that the um, service to the public by uh, all state agencies was only hindered by politicians, not by the agencies that actually serve the public. So uh, I got involved with the labor organization for Delaware State Troopers. It started off with the FOP, uh, which my father was a charter member. And then uh, I ended up, uh, we changed to the Delaware Troopers Association, where I went up through the um, ranks of the Troopers Association, eventually the president of the Delaware State Troopers Association, where I learned a little bit more about Delaware politics. I knew a lot about national politics and helping uh, public safety throughout the nation. The uh, Delaware uh, I saw that we were losing the ballots after the 2008 elections, and we had become one party rule, uh, recognizing the direction of one party and the now the, the um, extremist of that party taking over their own uh, Democrat party. I, I found it uh, difficult to see so many other people, especially in my district, that were going to end up being legislators from that side of the aisle that were not from Delaware, do not know local politics, did not know the relation of lo local politics and state politics and how we are tethered to the nation. So um, I decided to cease, you know, and go ahead and retire and stop my service with the state police and uh, president of the Troopers Association and became an elected official. Um, and, and it's, I think you guys have known me ever since then. I've been a, um, um, because of my background, I've been assigned to all the committees of public safety and, and that, that relationship. So that's where I am. Um, hopefully, I'll be running for the uh, Senate and succeed in running for the sixth Senate uh, and leave the House of Representatives where the rules are a little bit different, but it's basically the same amount of people. So um, you plan to run for the Senate district that you are now districted into and to let someone else run in the 20th representative district. Correct. And I think that I've laid the groundwork for a, um, a, an achievable district for the 20th to remain a conservative um, um, a seat and uh, remain an R. And not that right. we have a whole lot of R's, uh, but we, we cannot lose any either. We no, might we gain some. So um, I know you as someone who has tremendous constituent services. Uh, yes. You are constantly on duty. Um, you have relationships with the teachers in your district. I've been to meetings that you've put together with them. You have relationships with small business like I've seen in very few 
representative districts. You know every business in your district, I think. Um, you'll do the same in the House, in the Senate, uh, but you've also established um, and probably will campaign with whoever succeeds you in the House yeah. uh, to run for that office. Correct. Correct. And, and at this point, I hope it's Dallas Wingate who's uh, here with us today. Right. I understand he um, he may have already filed. I think he did. He did. He did. So uh, tell us what went on last week in the in the uh, House of Representatives. Well, there was um, I think that we're still trying to deal with uh, money to give back to the public uh, because of, you know, the. Um, um, the gas prices, and it was the argument was between either uh, reducing or suspending the gas tax, which seemed to be short lived, or to go ahead and um, I think the prevailing thought was three hundred dollars to to Delaware residents. Um, the suspension of the gas tax, I believe, was seen as also uh, helping people from outside the state, as and not just inside the state. So that had um, I think that got ironed out. That's where we're headed. Um, they're still talking about um, a um, re uh, realty transfer tax, um, the reduction in that to, to where it was originally. We're talking about um, the education right to know. Right. Can I stop you there? Um, sure. It's my understanding that the Democrats who had originally opposed the real estate transfer tax reduction now have taken that bill and made it one of their own. Is that correct? That is correct. Yes. And but that's not uncommon. Uh, and they see a good idea. They test the win. People want this. Right. And they said, we'll take possession and we'll pretend we yes. did it. Right. Yes. And sometimes yeah. I think the, the biggest crime in that occurring is not that they do it um, immediately, but they'll wait a, to, to the next session. So I've had bills that were good bills that everybody thought it was a good bill. And then the next, you know, they'll expire from session to session. You have to refile them and somebody on the opposite side will refile. And, and I think when they don't tell you, that actually hurts. Um, I've had uh, uh, my colleagues on the Democrat side call me up and say, listen, what are you going to do with that bill? I'd like to run it and see how it works with my name on it. And I don't mind joining them. It's not about our bill or my bill or uh, th these bills aren't to be, take to be taken possession of, but it's for the public. And something occurred, there was some ki kind of issue that allowed that answer, a, a legislative answer uh, to surface. So if it gets out to the public, that's where it needs to be. And I don't, it, it's happened to me a lot um, where the opposite side has stolen my bills, but it goes on all the time. Well, um, it's on the record that we had the good ideas first. <laughs> right. So um, do you serve on the committee where uh, the parents right to know bill was being heard? I do not, I do not. Mm -hmm. uh, however, okay. I've, I've championed that bill. Um, it's not anything that goes into partisanship. It just speaks about the, uh, the, the new technology that's available for parents to learn what's on the uh, curriculum and the, uh, have resources to what's being taught to their children. And I, my, my um, I, I guess I shouldn't give my resources, but uh, I know a lot of teachers, as you said earlier, and right. um, there are political uh, agendas being taught to our children in public school systems. And I think that it should raise a great, um, a great amount of um, um, awareness. I think that the parents, if they knew what was being taught, they may object. And just a reminder to everyone on this call who's probably acutely aware of it, but school board elections are coming up. We have Republicans running in several districts, multiple Republicans running in some of them against each other. So the state committee hasn't been involved. We had a day of action Sunday a week ago uh, where we went out and supported some of the local school board candidates who were uh, opposed by uh, someone other than another Republican and... Um, um, in a race, competitive race, and we had about uh, 14 or 18, maybe uh, 19 people sign up to help those candidates and to uh, get the word out to their districts about them. Uh, but we can use help if anybody is interested, put it in the chat or let us know, um, and we will let you know what you can do closer to May 10th, which is when the election is for school board. 
Um, Steve, uh, you serve on the, in law enforcement and you serve on committees related to public safety. Um, the new marijuana bill, the one that was divided because nobody could get it passed with, with the, so the original marijuana bill included regulations about taxing the sales of marijuana. And so it needed a super majority to pass. It couldn't right. get super majority. So the Democrats divided the bill into two bills, one to legalize it, but nobody can sell it or anything until the second half of the bill gets passed, which requires still a super majority um, that regulates the sale and taxation and, and uh, manufacture and, and all of that. Um, right. uh, did, you, did they put that in a committee that you serve on, law enforcement related? They, the did, new they did not. They put it into health and social services. The, um, so the, the, the bill just to legalize recreational marijuana, uh, that's out of committee already, I believe. And then, um, then they're going to follow it up. And see, the, the, I think the method is to force us who voted no to force us to, to vote yes, because somehow we have to regulate it, which is actually not true. Um, the, if you, if you, um, so what you're saying is they'll get, they'll get it without Republican votes or many Republican votes. They'll get it passed that it can be recreational. Then right. they'll present you with the bill that will regulate how that recreational marijuana can be sold, yes. manufactured, um, and distributed to the public. Right. And um, so, okay, I see. They're trying right. to make you vote yes on that as though they're, you support. That's the method that they're using is, is to force us to vote, vote yes. Um, I'm going to do my diligence to um, educate as many colleagues as I can to uh, that, that we're not being forced, that you do not have to vote for the regulation part. Um, and you can maintain your vote of a no. The, the majority of my district, I know, is, uh, is against recreational marijuana. I know that um, if you look at the vulnerable, and nobody's looking at the vulnerable, and then the vul who are the vulnerable when it comes to uh, recreational uh, marijuana or any introduction of an intoxicant into your society. And that's Kids. your, yeah, well, Kids. or as well. So um, they, they are already struggling and this isn't going to help them. The, um, but you're addicted. There are people who have suffered greatly from addiction um, and none of those who are fighting addiction at any level think that it's a great idea to uh, allow recreational marijuana. That being said, uh, it would look pretty odd for those who voted no in the past and have recognized these issues. Um, it, it, it would be difficult for them to justify their yes vote if the governor, and I believe that he plans to do this, is to veto that bill. If he right. vetoes the bill, then uh, we're going to have passed a regulation bill for something that's not legal. So it's it's got of... Um, it's kind of an interesting thing to watch right now. Well, I would think that a no vote on the regulation and taxation would uh, be a vote that would prevent the marijuana from being sold and distributed. So if you vote no on the legalization, it makes sense to vote no on the regulation because that prevents it from coming to market. Well, it, it, um, it, it, it kind of does, but I, I think you have to read the details of the bill in which I've skimmed over them uh, because it, now it's a completely different bill than, than it was in the past. Right, um, right. And uh, it, it still uh, allows in the original recreational, and it also brings it up in the, uh, in the regulation part, but the recreational part is um, it, it defines uh, the amount that you can have for personal use that you can't do it in public uh, and of um, anybody under 21. Uh, none of that, however, it, it has turned out to be correct or true in any jurisdiction that has legalized recreational marijuana. And all that right. statistically found uh, and, and followed by a government uh, a data service called, um, an acronym is HIDA, um, and HIDA stands for High Intensity uh, Drug Trafficking uh, Analysis. And uh, for those jurisdictions that are out there to grab that, I think the, the very... Uh, important one or most important one is the Rocky Mountain Haida. Here in Delaware, uh, we fall under Camden, New Jersey's Haida. Um, right. But the Rocky Mountain Haida has uh, Colorado, and which legalized recreational marijuana in 2012. 
in about 2014, they started to figure out what kind of data was pertinent and they've had a, an annual progression of how much data and what it did to society. And if you take a look at that, I don't see how anybody would fall in love with the idea of recreational marijuana. Uh, just yeah. take a look at just stats, just stats. Um, people, the people who have been on this call in the past know that I've talked about a friend of mine whose brother is or was an emergency physician uh, in uh, Colorado. And he's had two cases of people who died of starvation from chronic and persistent marijuana use because your body won't retain your nutrients. And they literally, they can't save them, they die. Um, and uh, we all know about the impaired driving and the impact that's had in Colorado. There's been well-documented cases of that. There's um, PET scans that show um, introduction of psychosis and other issues as a result. Um, and, and so, um, you know, if you look at the science, unfortunately, no one does these days if on abortion, COVID, or <laughs> marijuana. Right. Uh, if you look at the science, um, it, uh, it just doesn't make sense to, um, and, and we know, we know also that teens are the ones that think it's okay and are the ones that start with that drug. And I, I know there's been uh, statements made Oh, it's been proven, established, um, um, absolutely that it's not a, a, a gateway drug, but that's not true. Well, so, you've, you've been involved with uh, a lot of the prosecution part that the police have brought to you. And I remember some of my cases that came through your office. Um, there are people that stay right with marijuana and that's their drug of choice. But um, if you if you stop somebody and they found they're found to have marijuana that does not necessarily mean they're going to have any other drug but if you stop somebody for any of the harder drugs they always have marijuana with them yep. so uh, take a look at how that's related and you've seen that as well so when it um, comes to the teenage you're you're already on top of that and um i have been told already by the state police they've reached out to me because of my friendships with them that there's been an increase in um teenage and young adult uh, use of recreational marijuana, where it's not recreational yet, but they're using it already because they know that they can have just a, um, uh, a violation instead of a criminal charge for a certain amount right. of money. So we've had an increase currently within the last few months or so, or maybe it, uh, in the last part of the year, early, early this year, that uh, has been reported to me an increase in motor vehicle accidents that have marijuana related. Um, there was uh, the most recent one. I just got a phone call two weeks ago where someone didn't negotiate a turn. They put their vehicle in a body of water. The following day, uh, they sent a diver to hook it up, uh, you know, a tow truck, pull it out. And after sitting in water where you would think the smell would be washed out, the cab still smelled horribly of marijuana. So mm. it's, it, it's it, people are already trying to push it into their acceptance level already and it's very dangerous on our highways well and i'm a i'm a law and order person and it's still illegal federally i mean i know they're talking about changing its schedule in the federal uh guidelines federal legislation but it's still so. against the law federally and it's kind of like you know when the feds say you have the right as ice to go in and and get people who are have committed crimes and need to be deported, and then the state or city says, no, we're not gonna turn people over in violation of federal law. Well, state legalizing a, a substance that's illegal federally is the same equivalent in terms of the law, in my view. People will have different attitudes about the two issues, but they're equivalent in terms of the law. And so I'm very much opposed to uh, passing laws that that violate other laws that govern us and that federal law govern all the states so well i concur um, i concur with that if i can take it a little further and um i am a, a, a staunch believer or, or i lean he more heavily towards states rights instead of you know over federal uh laws however i don't think that is the case for a um the, the drug of marijuana and that is um THC is the only thing that actually gets you high in marijuana. There's a hundred different chemicals that are related to the marijuana plant. They're called cannabinoids, um, and we should be harnessing that uh, plant for medicines. Um, and I say this often, and it seems to make sense. If we can make medicines out of snake venom, then we should certainly do something out of that plant. But we can't because of that Schedule One. So when you mention 
that is the federal guideline uh, of, a, of the potency and the danger of a drug. And marijuana is on that schedule most dangerous drug list. Take that off of there. By If the federal government removed it, you would see our pharmaceutical companies being able to actually cultivate it and use it in some of their testing. And right now they can't. Uh, there's no reason why a state legislature and of the 62 members of the Delaware legislature, I've witnessed where we have uh, passed bills to allow marijuana to be used for certain ailments. And none of us have any medical background. We're being told this by you know activists instead of the medical profession. Um, it needs to be done at the federal level for that. Right. And, and I've said before, maybe on this, uh, this uh, series and maybe not, but uh, we solved um, the issue of abortion and the issue of marijuana politically rather than medically. And if we look at them medically, we, we don't know how much is enough or too much and what ailments, how much works for and what, what form of uh, the uh, drug might work best for what ailments uh, because we've not done any medical testing. And so we've, we've really sold the public short and they're guessing in the dark um, right. about, except for what people anecdotally know from their own experiences. And that's all that most these people have who are selling and distributing pursuant to state licenses in other states. Yes. So um, I have a question about uh, from the audience about HB 199, the constitutional amendment on gender identity. Do you know if it's gonna be coming up for a vote? Um, I would suspect that it would. This is the second leg of the two year. Uh, so I believe that it would certainly be come up, come up for a vote and they're probably going to use it as um, uh, some sort of politics against, you know, against us, I guess. Right. Um, so right. I can see that happening. Do you see any Republican support for that bill? I, you know, it, I, we haven't discussed it in length in our caucus. And I think, um, uh, if it does occur, um, I, I might be premature in, 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 in labeling that. Uh huh. So um, I have one more question, but let me see what this is. Uh, okay, sorry about that. Um, the uh, other question that came up from someone is uh, whether we're going to have uh, mail-in voting for the school board elections. And the uh, I can answer that one for you. Mail-in voting did end uh, in January of 21. Um, we do have early voting and early voting would apply to the school board elections if the Department of Elections sets it up and I expect they might. Um, uh, absentee ballots would apply in the same way um, I think probably the Department of Elections is going to mail to any voter eligible to vote in a school board election that's on the permanent absentee list a ballot uh, for them to vote absentee. As you may know, I've challenged the early voting law as it applies to the general election based on our Constitution. And I've challenged the permanent absentee list as it applies to the general election based on our constitution. Our constitution only applies to the general election. So it does not apply to the primaries, special elections, school board elections, or any others, only to the general election. So even if we're successful in bringing the action that Mr. I filed on behalf of Mr. Manella uh, with regard to early voting and permanent absentee, it would only apply to the general election. So I expect the rules that we existed prior to 2020's election will all apply to the, the election in uh, May for school board. That does not include mail-in voting, but it, uh, and then because January of this year, early voting kicked in, I expect early voting will apply. So um, let's see, um, I have a question here. Okay, thank you, um, Steve. What do you think is going to come up next week? What's on committee hearings? Uh, what kind of things are going to happen next week in the House? Well, you mean this week right here? Um, yeah. we're, yes. We're on, we're on a break right now. Um, okay. Yes. So we're seeing pre-filed um, uh, legislation that, that's coming out. Um, I know that I'm busy trying to chase some problems to either resurrect some bills 
that didn't get any attention um, and from that or mine from the past and also try to uh, cre possibly create some bills to answer some uh, issues that are specific to my district and see how, if I come up with a legislative answer, how it impacts the rest of the state. Um, and that's uh, a, usually a large task to find out how something that's significant right. to us may not be. Uh, right. and, my, and our solution down here may, act, may actually cause them a, a greater problem in another part of the state. So that's always uh, a, a prop that, that always takes a lot of your time in creating legislation. So I don't, I, I can't really give you a gauge um, because there's so much that's already poised. Uh, there's, as you would say, the finger is already on the trigger on some of these bills. Um, I know that the, some of the bills that keep coming up are like um, the um, assisted suicide or death with dignity. And, and I don't find that bill to be a partisan bill. I find that bill to, to have support or opposition in, in both parties. And I, I find that uh, a good thing. That's not a bad thing. Um, the, uh, uh, there's some evidence that shows that, uh, or, or what I don't like about the bill, um, I can explain it to you if you care, um, but um, I'm, go I'm gonna vote no for that at this point, but there's a lot of people who support me who wish that I would vo vote yes until I point out certain things in the bill. So, you know, there's always details that uh, the devil in the details is something that we always pay attention to. Right. Exactly. Okay. Um, I think that was all of the questions that have come up. Uh, Steve, in the future, are there any issues you're working on that you could use support from the people who are uh, listening today? Um, some advocacy or anything that would be helpful that you can ask for us to have? The, the um, um, I don't have any significant bills that are that are so important. I don't think uh, that anybody actually has bills that are just so important. Um, but I think that we have to observe the bills in their uh, progressions. So if you take a look through history and please spend some time looking at history and what happened to other civilizations that were great civilizations and how did they deteriorate? And we can see that... Um, I think it was, um, uh, um, God, I, I cannot remember who actually did, but he was a, he was a Roman philosopher who, who said, at one time uh, we fought crime and now the laws are, are what is criminal. He said something to that effect. And uh, so it's, we've become litigious, we've become a, a burden to ourselves um, and, uh, and, and a small business. Take a look at what's going on to your small business. We're trying to uh, tee up certain um, series of legislation that make it harder for small businesses to survive. Um, we can see that state employees have never been paid um, at, at, at the free market value. We've always uh, been paid less and, um, and that hurts us in good economic times, but it also helps Delaware, Delaware state employees during bad economic times when those who were making money actually don't have a job anymore. And it's the benefits that actually have been a recruiting tool for state service. Um, well, we're losing that edge by having legislators force um, those types of benefits into the private sector, where you can see that- Yeah, you're talking about the Family Medical Leave Act. Family, yes, Family Medical Leave Act. And that's just one of a series of uh, detrimental bills that are um, targeting mm -hmm. small business. We don't have the large business. And when you say that we're pursuing bills that are going to hurt small business, you don't mean the Republicans. You mean the legislature as a whole has consistently been introducing these bills, the Democrat majority. And you, as a, you're very much a friend to your small business, I know. It's a friend I, I of your small business. You, you, uh, you so know the impact it has. And those, those small businesses pay people enough to raise their families. And that's important. It should right. be important to us. Um, and that's, right. so, you know, the, the economy is one way to erode every other issue. Nothing else is going to matter if you cannot have a strong economy. But I also recognize the, the public safety. And actually, when I say public safety, I'm talking about um, your constitutional right to, to carry a firearm or have a firearm. Um those things are, uh, you see a series of bills 
for firearms, which is what's what's the end result? If you don't pay attention to what the end result is, you're going to allow uh, greater advances in firearms or gun control when the actual problem is being ignored, and that mm -hmm. is who's pulling the trigger. And that's that's where part we of the strategy. I'm sorry. So part of the strategy of the Democratic into, Party to, to incrementally take away your right. rights. Right. Um, or impose. Guns are going to be just like drugs. And that is if you if you see illegal drugs on the street, you're going to continue to see illegal guns on the street. And when all your law law uh, abiding and I, I, I hate to use that because it's almost a cliche by the NRA, but people who abide by the law will surrender their weapons only to be made a victim of a crime in due time. It does come to you. Um, look, I carried a gun for 24 years um, and, and it, it happens, um, but it's not just, you know, the guns, uh, take a look at who's, like I said, who's pulling that trigger and then this mental health. And of course, mental health has become very close, closely related in some of our policies in Delaware to, um, uh, uh, to substance abuse. So those things matter as well. And we, that's, that's where it becomes more expensive. It's cheaper to make the gun illegal than it is to actually invest in our mental health and substance abuse for our citizens. Um, and, and, and that hasn't gotten better. It's gotten worse over the last decade or so. So that's, that's absolutely correct. And I, and I will say the other issue where we see that it's um, either less of, of less expensive or less uh, trouble uh, to manage issues is in the manner in which prosecutor's offices are handling crimes. When you let a criminal go and to save money or to let people be on this, to give them more freedom, you're letting the people who are victims of crimes bear the burden yep. that yep. we all in a community have historically borne together. You are putting yep. it right on the backs of victims. You're saying, you know, you suffer and yep. We don't pay as much for the jails and we don't pay as much for the police. We don't pay as much for the prosecutors, um, but we're paying as a community. We're paying because those victims are paying right. because we're letting crime be more rampant by not addressing it properly. And so mm. I think it's really important people understand that um, yes. this is not yes. a matter. We can either act together um, and uh, and support each other in a way that's rational and common yes. sense and uh, or we can um, let what is happening in some places not as much in Delaware although our AG has been a little more progressive than we're than represents the state um, but um, in other states we can see in other cities what happens when you choose to let someone else bear the burden rather than the community. And there are victims who are really hurting out there and they're not being supported. And I think uh, it's important to remember that. Wilmington. Wilmington's the, the flagship of that type of policy. Yep. How's that working out? Yep. And we've got a bunch of state legislators yep. who are trying to fix Wilmington's problems at the state level and it shouldn't be done there. It should be done in Wilmington. Um, so tolerance of any type of activity, criminal activity is only going to invite more of that, and you're going to have more of a problem. And uh, so, Wilmington. Well, we that. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. Well, uh, thank you, everyone. I think we've gotten to all your questions. Um, Steve, I can't thank you enough, Representative Smick, for joining us today. Good luck in your race for the uh, Senate, and uh, good luck to Dallas. And uh, I don't know if you're going to have other people filed. Uh, uh, but uh, so the state committee has to stay out of it if there's multiple candidates. And I know some others have expressed some interest, but good luck to anyone who's a candidate out there. Remember your, oh, Janice, you're on the uh, call. Janice Laura is on the call. She has filed to run for auditor of the state of Delaware. And uh, we welcome you here. Uh, we're excited about the opportunity uh, for us to win that race. We, uh, we really want to... Um, um, field candidates in every office this year so that we can up, up ticket and down ticket, bring out Republicans to vote. Um, this is an opportunity that might be as similar as 1994. It's another opportunity that the Democrats have created 
by their horrible leadership, their horrible policies, and their horrible <coughs> uh, failure to uh, consider real people's and the impact of their decisions on real people. And we have an opportunity in Delaware. Let's go out there and win Republican races. So everybody, East race, the uh, 10th of May, uh, school board races, please uh, come out and uh, be, uh, be uh, counted, vote. And if you can, help our candidates get other people out to vote with phone calling, et cetera. So thank you very much, everyone, for joining us this morning. Have a great week. Thank you. Thank you.